Okay, next category of disorders are known as the somatoform disorders. All right, now these are going to need a little bit of explanation. Uh, and, then, and then once you understand the explanation, that hopefully these will make a little bit more sense. These, these are, are uh, known to baffle some researchers and baffle some doctors. Okay, because the definition says that these are disorders in which symptoms take a somatic form. That means a bodily or physical form. The patient displays symptoms, but when doctors take a closer look, um, it is hard to find any sort of physical cause. It might be a deep down psychological problem, but uh, when it comes to uh, physical causes, they seem to be supposed, possibly even uh, faked. So the first one we want to talk about is what's known as a conversion disorder. Now, these aren't symptoms. These are actual physical disabilities that a person might display, but doctors cannot find any physical cause only perhaps some sort of deep psychological explanation. One type of conversion disorder is known as glove anesthesia. That's the, the name should hopefully give you, a, give you an idea of what it's about. This is when a person reports a complete or partial lack of feeling in the hands. All right, now uh, you might be wondering what could potentially cause something like this, or as you see here, uh, the, the sudden loss of sight. Well, doctors would say that a traumatic experience either involving the hands or involving the eyes, something so traumatic, so horrific that that person might not ever want to hold anything in his hands again. Like this picture, uh, let's let's assume that this is a, a father holding his lifeless son. Talk about a traumatic moment and as a result that father never wanting to, to feel again or, or see anything again. That's what's known as a conversion disorder, also known as glove anesthesia. One of the more st typical or stereotypical somatoform disorders, you guys might have heard of this one, is known as a hypochondriac or hypochondriasis. A hypochondriac is someone who interprets the smallest of symptoms or normal physical sensations as the onset of some very serious diseases. So these are individuals who um, fill their medicine cabinets. They, uh, at, at the onset of a symptom, they are on the phone right away. And if the doctor says, you're fine, you sneezed, don't worry about it, they will hang up and call another doctor. Okay. Hypochondriacs come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Some just constantly take pills, let's say, as not a way to stop a, uh, a disease, but to even prevent it from happening in the first place. So, and that could even uh, cause someone to get sick. Therefore, putting them in this very, very terrible cycle of um, thinking the diseases are coming from somewhere else when in fact they could be causing them themselves. So that's a hypochondriac. And we are, uh, I'm recording this April of 2020, you know, hypochondriacs might be having a very difficult time right now when the, the nation is on high alert uh, with the past of, of a virus. And when a single symptom pops up, they might be very quick to react that it's the beginning of, of you know, their onset COVID-19. Okay, so that again is the somatoform disorder known as a hypochondriac. Okay, trying to explain the often unexplainable disorders, who better? Than Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud says there's two possibilities here. One is that this could be what's known as primary gain, is a very traumatic event associated with a particular body part, like we talked about before. Um, the, the gentleman holding a lifeless child in his hands, where Freud says the brain is trying to prevent an acting out of a sensation, or it could even be the prevention from acting out of forbidden desire. Say, for example, and I know this might make some people feel a little uncomfortable, but let's say an individual gets caught masturbating. That is a traumatic moment, and as a way of blocking out that traumatic moment, Freud would argue that the person might report a temporary or a permanent loss of uh, the sensation in the hands or other body parts. Then 
there's what's known as secondary gain. Now, secondary gain uh, gets, I think, uh, has a lot more leg to it when when you see it, you'll you know it. For example, as a father, you often see it in children where they learn a behavior, like you see in this picture here. That's not my daughter, but they learn a behavior when they know a reward will follow, such as if a child wants a hug or they want some love and and attention. They might fake a symptom to get picked up by the mother, get picked up by the father, and held for an extended amount of time. So, all right, and you know you you often see the the symptoms clear right up. The crying goes away, the the sniffles disappear as soon as that parent picks that child up uh, as a escape or reward. How about this one? Faking symptoms to avoid participating. All right, when a kid doesn't want to participate in a, in a long distance run, a two mile run during tryouts. All of a sudden, uh, the ankle hurts, the quadricep hurts. This could be what's known as secondary gain as a way to avoid participating in a certain part of the practice and a certain part of the, the tryout. And there is the possibility that there are some strong and deeply neurological problems at, at play here in these individuals. So that it's not just entirely, um, you know, psychoanalytical, if you will, a Freudian explanation. It can also be explained biologically. Okay, another category, and we're we're really just going to focus on one disorder here, and it's uh, it falls under the dissociative category, and these are disorders in which uh, a part or section of the personality becomes separated, also known as dissociated from the rest. That's where we get this name, dissociative disorders. A dissociative disorder usually comes from some form of trauma, either in early childhood or later on in an adult life if it's, a, if it's an isolated traumatic moment. Uh, and that moment creates an overwhelmingly stressful experience. Okay, And dissociative disorders can often be linked with or follow a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. So what might that type of overwhelmingly stressful experience be? Could be uh, being a victim of rape, surviving abuse, surviving war, um, witnessing or surviving, say, a terrorist attack such as 9 11. All right, now um, it might not be the case that the personality splits and becomes something else. It could be that part of the personality just simply forgets and, and doesn't want to remember, say, a certain portion of, of one's life. Uh, these two boys here, if they look familiar, uh, they were in local media, local news a few years ago. On the right is a boy named Ben Ownby, and on the left is Sean Hornbeck. So these were the two boys that were kidnapped and uh, molested by Michael Devlin. He's the Kirkwood resident, worked at the Kirkwood Emos. Uh, I am not saying that these boys have dissociative amnesia, but they could make good candidates. They, without a doubt, went through a very traumatic period. Sean Hornbeck was kidnapped and um, um, held captive basically by Devlin for four years. Sh uh, ben Ownby, a much shorter span. I think it was a matter of 48 um, to 72 hours or so. Regardless, though there are moments in both of their lives that might want to be forgotten, and so it could be the case that their brain chooses to dissociate. They, they forget more and more details with every passing day. The one that you guys hear about, I think, more, if you've ever seen the movie Split, is what used to be called multiple personality disorder. It's now known as dissociative identity disorder, or DID. This is a person who exhibits two or more distinct and alternating personalities. All right, The person you're born as is called the host, and every other personality outside of that is what's known as an alter. And every alter can be a very distinct individual. They can have their own names, even their own memories, Mannerisms, meaning one could be left-handed, one could be right-handed. Voices, ages, there's no limit to the age of, of alter personalities, and they can even have different IQs. These were, of course, all tested in controlled settings to, to make this factual. Usually, alter egos are, or alter personalities are nonviolent. Sometimes they can turn violent on the self, okay? And Dr. Phil, um, you can search Dr. Phil Tracy. If you do that, Dr. Phil, and then the episode of Tracy, Tracy talks about how her alter identity was violent towards her as a way to sabotage Tracy's 
daily life. Interpersonality amnesia right here is when there's no conscious awareness of the other's experience. So they don't realize that they've got alter egos. And so what can happen is the person goes through periods of blackout. They have no idea what was happening. And what was happening was their one of their alter identities were um, um, in charge, if you will, at the moment. Kenneth Bianchi is one of the more famous cases of dissociative dis identity disorder. Now, this one's interesting because it brings up a point I want to make is that he had the nickname of the Hillside Strangler. And he was eventually caught and accused of killing 10 women in California. And when he stood trial, he said, it wasn't me, Your Honor. It was Steve, my alter identity. And uh, what had basically been concluded is that Kenneth Bianchi read up on the disorder and tried to fake it, which, which, um, um, from what I understand, happens a lot as people try to try to use that on the, on the stand and plead guilty by reason of insanity, excuse me, not guilty by reason of insanity. And more and more it's, uh, being, being proven false. And, and that's why a lot of, uh, psychologists want dissociative identity, uh, almost thrown out and and put in more as a as a personality disorder and not diagnosed dissociative disorder. Okay, I will share a video with you guys of a woman named Encina. Uh, you probably want to fast forward a little bit, but she will talk about her experience with dissociative identity. And uh, you be the judge. Is this real? Is is this a very talented actress? Okay, or are, are we actually seeing one of her alter personalities come out and, uh, and, and share with us? So, again, I'll share the video of Encina. Now, how can we explain these? All right, well, the, I think the top explanation for dissociative disorders is a protective response to childhood trauma. All right, so imagine you've got a young boy who's abused by an uncle, he can't do anything at that time to fight back. So what does he do? He comes up with scenarios or an imagination that could fight back. And day after day, year after year, that imagined person might come to life and turn into one of the, the individual's alter personalities as, as a protector, if you will. Happens a lot. Um, it says here, and this was a study done in the, in the late 90s, that 11 out of 12 murderers with dissociative identity disorder recalled some form of childhood abuse. So childhood abuse seems to be a major factor in dissociative identity. Uh, dissociative identity also has been linked to damage to brain areas that control personality, that control handedness, and control traumatic memory storage. So parts of the limbic system and part of the front, parts of the frontal lobe also linked with uh, some recipients of dissociative identity. And some skeptics argue that dissociative identity is nothing more than a very fantasy, highly fantasy prone, emotionally vulnerable person. All right. And, and they would argue that this is more of a personality type than dissociative. So hopefully you guys were entertained by that. Hopefully you got to, to watch Encina a little bit. That is uh, somatoform and dissociative disorders.